Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to 198.4 Fiction Radio. I'm your host, Sean Coney, and with me is my co-host, Dustin Weiskopf. What's up, Dustin? Hey, Sean. I'm just uh, ready to begin again, as that is the film we're talking about today. Begin Again 2013's uh, directorial follow-up to the movie once the musical follow-up he did do a a non-music related movie in between as i was saying that i knew that i was saying it incorrectly <laughs> and i and i knew and i felt like i was digging a hole in it and i was waiting for you to help get me out of it so thank you yes john carney's musical follow-up to his breakout film once i have not seen once i have seen once and famously uh walked out of it from the theater uh, when when I saw it because I I was so uninspired by the movie which is not something I've, I've really done before or since so you're really thrilled about the day we we do once oh I'm super thrilled I on and and that's that's honest I am super thrilled to talk about it I can't wait to watch it again and to have thoughts about it and to crack them open on this podcast on this radio station and that's not even the only john carney movie we're going to talk about because we have sing street to deal with as well that's which right. is the follow-up to this the follow-up to this sing street which i know nothing about i only know one song but i'm a fan of it already so i'm genuinely looking forward to the covering the rest of the john carney music related universe all right well so i think this is a moment where i would love to let our listeners in on a little behind the scenes of how we get stuff done here, specifically how we picked the films that we are going to talk about in this first run of episodes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as you know, if you've been a longtime listener, uh, you've you've already <laughs> heard <laughs> two whole episodes of this show, uh, one about the film Airheads, the, the comedic masterpiece from the early 90s, and one about the film Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping. So the reason you heard those two first is because those are the two that Sean and I agreed should be first. We each made a list of movies with bands that we wanted to talk about on this show, and and those aligned. However, the rest of our lists did not line up, and we decided the best and fairest and most fun way to do it would be to put everything into a hat and draw names of films. So the reason I'm bringing this up basically is this is a this is a film that I had pretty low expectations of. I kind of picked it because I wanted one we could beat up a little bit. And what I, you know, wasn't thinking about at the time was the whole name in the hat thing. And so this feels a little strange going into this one right off the bat, but this is the order we picked it in. So 2013's Begin Again is what we're doing. And you know what? Going into this, I was also not super thrilled about the prospect. I had never heard of this movie before. I knew absolutely nothing of it before I started listening to the music and then watched the movie. But I was very pleased with the film. It left me feeling very happy and joyful and inspired afterward. And really, (laughs) yeah, I recommend my mom to check it out. (laughs) I, I thought it was pretty dang good. That's fantastic. I am so glad that that happened for you. I found it to be kind of boring and tedious. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. So uh, I, will be, I will be bringing a different perspective, I suppose. Well, you know, if we're going to agree on everything, that's not super cool for the listeners, I would assume. Yeah, let's, uh, let's duke it out on this one. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, but before we get too deep into the weeds, are you aware that this movie had a different title originally? I actually did not know that. Yeah, it was originally called Can a Song Save a Life? Ooh, that is artsy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, as as much as I wanted it to be called twice, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, either of those would have been better for me because uh, throughout the process of researching this, watching the film and listening to the soundtrack, I did a lot. I guess I just do a lot of voice searching in my daily life these days. Mm. And let me tell you, Begin Again is something that neither Roku Televisions nor Spotify likes. They they. They both either restart what is playing or tell you that they cannot do that, but they do not interpret it as a title of anything. AI is really winning, buddy. Just give it some time, they say. (laughs) Dustin, do you know what the budget was for this movie? I don't know what the budget was. I I don't imagine it was 
too big. What do you, what do you think it was? I'm going to guess it's some. So I, the one thing I do know is that Adam Levine did not take a paycheck for his role in this film. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, he, he did it. He did it pro bono. Wow. OK, so it can't be that much. Uh I, I'm going to say 10 million, somewhere in the 10 million range. Hey, you know, you were you were pretty close, but Price is Right rules, you were you were over, so you lost the showdown. But it, oh, really? Yeah, eight million bucks. Eight million. Wow, mm-hmm. it's a pretty big cast for eight million. I mean, getting Ruffalo in there alone is pretty big get, even in 2013. You know, I'm sure he was getting a pretty good payday normally. And this film, I so one, another thing I I did read about this film is that there were a lot of. Uh, guerrilla techniques employed because this film uses new york city as as one of its characters pretty heavily yeah they are all over the place recognizable places to definitely folks who live in new york not not they're not using all the famous tourist places but uh they get around and apparently one of the ways they saved money is by shooting handheld in a lot of these locations because if you've ever filmed in new york one of the ways they get you is if you have a tripod that's when the fees start coming in oh but if you can keep the camera off the ground it basically is treated as a smaller production and you can film i mean without permits in some cases or with different cheaper permits okay loophole i know this because of the reality tv work i've done we always kept the sticks off the ground in new york all right good to know so on a budget of eight million dollars it brought in 16 million dollars in the u.s and canada and 84 million globally it's the most successful movie we've covered so far (laughs) it really is yeah yeah that's because true. we've done two flops up to this point yeah so- I, yeah i'm not sure over the years i'm sure airheads has recovered or whatever but at the time <laughs> yeah yeah Fl- flops that have their own fandoms for sure but this one actually made money on its original release on its original budget so what's this flick about dustin well it's about a few people it's the old intertwined story but i would say the main characters are greta a songwriter played by kira knightley singer songwriter and uh dan mulligan a music producer who's kind of on his way out uh at the beginning of this film played Played by by mark Mark ruffalo Ruffalo. uh i mean there's a bunch of other people in it adam levine plays a significant role Catherine keener i wish got to do more in this film but she's just kind of there i agree with you she's so great in everything and then uh hayley steinfeld there for what i consider some of the cringiest scenes in this movie the the daughter stuff <laughs> uh and who else james corden is in this film CeeLo green also in this film yep a person that appears on screen yep <laughs> That is correct. Uh, but anyway, it's the story of uh, a, a guy who's who seems to be on his way out of the music biz. He's, he, he used to be a big shot. You get hints of how he was a big shot uh, A&R rep back in the day. Uh, but he hasn't pulled any, any successful artists in for his label lately. And they can him. He's, uh, he's pretty depressed. He goes out walking the streets of New York. And he stumbles upon an open mic where Greta James is playing one of her songs and they start a they start a a beautiful artsy working relationship does that cover it i think yeah i think so i don't want to give away too much oh no well why would we let's start with something i did enjoy okay the film and that is adam levine's character for well okay adam levine's character dave cole Mm -hmm. spelled a lot like Grohl, which i thought was interesting right yeah anyway adam levine's character dave cole is a pop star who's uh for lack of a better word popping in his own right he's he's getting really successful really quick at the beginning of this movie and I think some of the things they do with his character to show the silliness of pop stars and the fickleness of pop stars is is pretty funny and pretty on point with just making him a womanizing douchebag. Uh, Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. sure. Yeah. 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 And uh, and his turn um, not to give away too much, but like he's he's away for a while in the film and he shows back up in act three and he's like full mumford and sons in (laughs) in his appearance and i just thought that was a really funny dig of you know on musicians of that particular time of 2013 yeah so okay i think a place to start because okay so my process in preparing for this episode was i listened to the soundtrack first and watched the movie after and i me too i I think i've decided that's the way i want to do these from now on because it it gives me kind of a different perspective it allows me to sit with the songs for a bit first and then experiencing the experiencing them in in the context of the film but one thing that stuck out to me right away when i listened to this soundtrack was it had this sound and it was sort of a 
a sound that seemed a, a bit more dated than even 2013 when it when it came out when these songs were written and i was like what band does this remind me of it reminded me specifically of a band and specifically of a song and it didn't take me long to come up with this little blast from the past you get what you give by the new radicals that's right and i thought what a strange coincidence this is that they've decided to write something that that just like plucked the same string in my brain as this new radical song and would you believe it lo and behold most of the songs in this film were co-written by a guy named greg alexander who is was the lead singer of the new radicals oh yeah pretty fantastic I didn't have that experience when I was listening to the music first in thinking that the Dave Cole songs sounded like someone else. To me, it just sounded like a Maroon 5 song. You could have just told me that the two very poppy Dave songs, No One Else Like You and Higher Place, were unreleased Maroon 5 songs. Before I watched the movie and did the research, I 1,000% would have believed that. It wasn't until I did the research saw that Greg Alexander had co-written these songs and was like, holy shit, that's when it really started to flood in with like the jazzy pianos and the cadence of the lyrics for the songs were super new radicals. And I was like, oh, well, this makes it a lot more fun for me. The singing cadence, yeah, that was that was honestly the thing that that made me make the realization. I mean, I I did still think when I when I had the oh this sounds like the New Radicals realization, I was still under the impression that Adam Levine and or Maroon Five were behind the writing of these songs and they were just sort of going for a style that sounded like New Radicals. But uh, no, turns out it was the dude. And the the thing about the the cadence, I feel like. Higher Place has the cadence vocally, whereas No One Else Like You has the jazzy piano that we know from New Radicals. It's like he split up the things that he was known for and sort of divided and conquered <laughs> multiple songs with it. Indeed, yeah. And and just 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 selfish purposes here, totally selfish Sandlerverse purposes here, but the New Radicals song ends the movie Click, so I think of that every time I hear that song. I think of the Adam Sandler movie Click. That's right. And also, this is something I didn't know going into it, but Radio Man makes an appearance in this movie at the hour and 15 minute mark no way radio man siding baby radio man all right sean uh you gotta re-record the entire sandler verse video no uh no <laughs> <laughs> for folks who don't know radio man is uh a guy who shows up in more films than you'd think as an extra uh, or background character. Over a hundred. There's a document there's a documentary you can watch on him. He's the most used movie extra in probably history of film. It's a really cool story. Another uh, random fun fact that I found out doing the research for this, uh, there's another song that Greg Alexander co-wrote with a woman. Her name is Sophie Ellis Bexter, and the song is Murder on the Dance Floor, which was featured at the end of the movie Saltburn. Have you seen this movie? Do you know the song? Oh, yeah. I, I have I have seen the movie, and I'm familiar with the song. I had no idea he was involved. That song came out in 2001, Dustin. No way. I thought it was a brand new fucking song when I saw that movie. It was supposed to be a new Radical song, but they disbanded before they could finish it. Wow. It's so much better in its current form than I think it would have been as a new Radical song. I would agree with that. Gonna burn this goddamn house right down. Four, three, two, one. Oh, I know. It doesn't sound so much like a 2001 song as it does like a 2012 era song. Right. Well, that is wild. Yeah, very interesting, right? Yeah. Almost as interesting as this being our second episode in a row talking about Adam Levine being in this project. That's right. And it's the second one where he performs a song from the damn movie on The Voice. Did he do Lost Stars? He did. He did. Here. Here's a clip. Take my let's see. Sometimes 
so that song lost stars that's the that's the big single from the film and that, that was actually nominated for an oscar it was it lost but yes it was nominated did lose yeah uh, i mean the soundtrack as a whole was nominated for a lot of awards and seems like it was beaten pretty roundly by the uh needle drop soundtrack of guardians of the galaxy at a lot of a lot of those uh competitions sure yeah and that makes total sense that was a banger a soundtrack beast. yeah different beast but it, it was an absolutely banger soundtrack you're right but i mean all things considered this soundtrack of all new music still hit number 83 on the billboard hot 100 and that's pretty impressive for a soundtrack that is pretty today. impressive it's definitely something i was not aware of at the time but uh now we're getting into we'll get into what i didn't like about the film but I, they are they are all technically great songs i have no problems necessarily with the song actually i have one specific problem with a song and that's uh, on the Kira Knightley version of Lost Stars. There's just some really hideous uh, auto tune that is not covered well. Whoa, is me. If we're not careful, turns into reality. But what are you going to do? She's an actress first. An actress first. And honestly, I, I, look, dude, I can't sing like that. I didn't know she could sing at all. I thought she sounded pretty good. She also learned how to play guitar for this movie. Impressive. I have a guitar. I've had one for over a decade. I've tried so many times to learn how to play that fucking thing, and I just cannot do it. I bought a video game to try and teach me how to play it. Nope, that doesn't work. I tried apps on my phone. That doesn't work. I tried looking at YouTube stuff. That doesn't work. So she's kicking ass in this movie as far as i'm concerned i agree with you i think i think she did a great job i think she i think she brought a lot of good stuff to the role i ultimately my problems with this film are not with the performances um they are with uh the story itself the storytelling itself um my i guess my my big overarching issue that i came to with this is the whole thing is set up like it's this battle between you know uh overproduced pop music of now versus something real something from the heart something uh with feeling and i think it fails to deliver on that front because everything feels overproduced to me okay so is it a step you can't take back where he's visualizing the yes instruments coming in yes so I, on one hand we're supposed to believe that this uh this producer mark ruffalo's character like he's he's just got a, a sixth sense for this stuff right he he knows what's good and he knows what's real uh and he goes in in one of the first scenes where he sees uh Keira knightley's character he's visualizing drums and a string section and all this stuff coming in and while he's visualizing that and, and we're hearing it as the audience in the movie i'm going you're ruining the song bro like i think the stripped down acoustic version was the real version and and everything he's adding to it is all the overproduced stuff that he's his character speaks out against i just think every recorded song in this film is very slick too slick to be towing this line of like pretending like you're trying to do something underground or indie yeah i didn't think any of that stuff i really liked that scene i thought it was pretty cool insight into how a producer produces a song and how they see music coming together i did think visually it was a really cool scene i liked see the whatever tricks they did to make the cello play itself make the drum start clicking on its own they just removed the musicians just painted them out vfx mm -hmm. style mm -hmm. okay i saw i saw that in an interview from john carney yeah i thought that was a clever little trick i just i think i think you're you're walking dangerous territory anytime you make a movie like this where you're trying to show sort of the realness behind the scenes of of any of these creative industries whether it's the music industry the film industry whatever but i i think you you risk sliding down a slippery slope into cringiness pretty quickly and and i just i got a lot of that with this music producer uh a and r guy the whole uh I, you know, I, I gotta be drunk to that's when the magic happens. And it's like, I get that. I get that on some level that that's how people have worked creatively in this industry. But when you say it out loud, it just sounds so, so weird. So off putting to me. Fair enough. I, yeah, I didn't have the cringe aspect of Mark Ruffalo's character. Gotcha. And honestly, the second he came up with the idea of just recording all of the songs in the street and whatever happens just keep recording it and then for them to record it in various places around the city instantly 
reminded me of the 2014 Foo Fighters album, Sonic Highways, where they recorded all of the songs in different cities around the country and then had musical guests from each city come in and play on those tracks. Oh, wow. Yeah. I had that hadn't that thought hadn't even occurred to me. Mm-hmm. I wonder. I wonder if uh, you know John Carney seems like he's pretty music industry adjacent. So maybe he knew some folks. Maybe he knew some stuff was going on while making this and and was inspired by that. Yeah, he could have. Were the Foo's actually playing like alive out on the street? No, they they would go into different like they would go to New Orleans and then they would go to like this historic studio in New Orleans and then they would get musicians okay, from gotcha. New Orleans to come in and help them create a song with the vibe of the city. Gotcha, gotcha. I think the playing outdoors in this film, you know, it was a cool it's a cool idea, cool setting. I instantly was like, well, they obviously didn't record this outside with that microphone on the end of a broomstick because <laughs> it sounds like they recorded it in a studio. You know, I I don't fault them for that. That's that's fine. That's that's a good little nod to uh DIY indie values. So going back to Lost Stars, you said that you would have preferred the song to be that stripped down version that Kira Knightley sings in from her perspective. Would that be your favorite version of the song or do you like one of Dave's versions better? Of Lost Stars? Yeah, because he does two versions. He does like the stripped down Greta version, but like his version live in the movie at the very end. Uh And then there's also the stadium pop version, as Greta calls it, that she listens to on the album when he plays it for her in the park. I I, I guess ultimately I I do prefer the stripped down version. I mean, I fully appreciate that they refer to the uh, overproduced version of Lost Stars in the film and on the soundtrack. I I, I think it's funny that they made it and they knew what they were making and and how sort of ridiculous it sounds, especially his like rubber band vocals at the bridge near the end of the song. That's the thing that caught my attention every time. The pop version of it sounds like they took Adam Levine's vocals from the normal version and then just sped it up. It sounds it sounds really, really weird. I am pretty certain that is what they did. I had the same thought, and it really does sound like they just sped it up. It almost sounds like he couldn't sing that fast or couldn't uh, make those voice modulation changes that fast. This is just... uh... Uh, that right there is just what I what I associate generally <laughs> Adam Levine and Maroon Five with in my in my head and and why I typically stay away. <laughs> the, now <laughs> it's, imp- it, it's impressive that he can do it. It's not my cup of tea. That yeah, that's fair. It's also not my cup of tea. But uh, uh, Greta's music is also not my cup of tea. Going into this thing, this is not any fair. music that I would seek out on my own. But I enjoyed sure. it. A fair amount, all things considered. Well, I'm glad of that. Um, one of my favorite songs, probably my favorite song on this film, is 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 one called Coming Up Roses. And that is, it's one of the few songs that does not feature Greg Alexander from New Radicals. But it is one that is co-written by Glenn Hansard, the uh, star of John Carney's previous film, Once. I just feel like it's got more of a groove than anything else in this movie had. There's just a little more going on on the on the on the on the back end on the drum and bass side. There's just a little more jazz influence. There's a little more there's a little more going on musically. Well, that's fair. I mean, I'll 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 say this. When I was listening to the music before I watched the movie, this was a song that I completely bypassed. I heard it once or twice never registered for me Mm -hmm. in my brain but then i saw it in the movie and the way that it was used in the movie and i i don't know but i really like the song now i genuinely like the song yeah this is one i i could say i i I do genuinely enjoy this is the one song where i wish they had added the new york elements to the recording of the song for the soundtrack if that makes sense oh Yes, the atmospheric sounds. Exactly, around, yeah. That we, that we got in the movie. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is the one song where I really would have liked that to have been the case on the soundtrack. If they would have put those in for this song, I, I, I would have been 
fine with it and probably pretty happy about it. Yeah, I could have gone for that. I also I <laughs> I, I sort of like the um, like a fool song. And I think that the scene in which it happens helps play a part in that because it's like the greatest fuck you drunken voicemail you could leave to somebody is like pretty, <laughs> pretty great. It totally is. I that that's a song that I didn't like as much on the soundtrack alone because it felt that was the one that's felt the most like musical, like Broadway musically to me because it had uh, it does this she, she does this talk singing thing. And I have loved you anyway. Siska and the the, the, the the plotting plinky little piano. It's got musical vibes. For sure. But I did really enjoy it in the context of the movie. And, and I kept trying to think throughout this, like what real world songs might have inspired these. And this one, I keep coming back to this Rilo Kiley song, Does He Love You? And I just feel like this... Mm. It just feels like a, a, a spiritual, at least predecessor to Like a Fool. Get a real job Keep the wind at your back And the sun on your face You know, it's it's funny that you are trying to think of what inspired the Greta songs because... In the Lone Rangers episode, you said a lot of times when they do a song for a movie, it feels a couple of years behind. Yeah. A lot of the Greta songs, to me, sounded like Michelle Branch and Vanessa Carlton. And the New Radicals. Uh, yes. And the New Radicals. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. I guess they were they were even more late 90s. But yeah. 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 No, definitely. I, I, I do think uh, Mr. Alexander has a style, and that style lives in a time and that time is the one you described not that it's bad again i very much enjoy those two poppy songs that dave cole has nobody else like you and higher place and it 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 might be because i now associate them with sounding like new radicals and that makes me happy i don't care sure but I do, I do like the songs and I get happy when they come on the shuffle now. Yeah, no, I, I mean, to your, to your point of, of it, it sounding more early aughts, I think that that gets to a big reason of why I didn't think this film was as exciting as, as I'd hoped. Uh, it, so much specifically the fact that it's set in new york so much had happened in new york between the early aughts and and when this came out i mean you've got uh the yeah yeah yeah's tv on the radio the strokes uh lcd sound system all these things came out of new york in this sort of intervening time between the new radicals and this movie and this stuff still sounds like none of that never ever happened and and so that's where i that's where i kind of call bullshit on mr producer going like this this is it this is the sound i've been waiting for and I, i'm like i think it's been around bro i guess i can uh, yeah i can see that perspective you know but there is one other fictional artist in this movie that we really haven't talked about yet and it's played by CeeLo Green, and mm -hmm. he he plays a fictional uh, artist called Troublegum. Troublegum, like bubblegum. Exactly, but trouble. We never really see him performing any of his uh, album tracks. He does sort of an ad lib rap at one point right. in the film. So, Dustin, do you want to hear the worst possible song for CeeLo to have sung in hindsight? <laughs> I already know what it is. It's, it's called Horny. And uh, here we go. <laughs> and once again, I can really hear the Greg Alexander influence of the beat of this song. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that's a pretty good groove, honestly. Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, the only other song I was going to mention, and this one was not on Spotify uh, on the official soundtrack, but it is on YouTube, is Into the Trance. I don't remember when it was in the film. Credits, maybe? This isn't Dave or Greta. Who is this? It's Greg Alexander. It's full-on New Radicals guy doing uh, doing his best Prince impression from what it sounds like. Oh, interesting. I mean, that's not a fictional artist, so fuck that song, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm okay mentioning it because it's the same guy who wrote the fictional song. Sure. No, I'm just being ridiculous. Yes, you are. Yep, that's yes, me. Yes, you are. <laughs> Mr. Ridiculous. So, Dustin, if these three artists, Greta James, Dave Cole, and Trouble Gum, 
were in mm. our reality releasing music, would you listen to any of the three of them? You know, I would definitely give Greta another shot because the way she's portrayed, I think I think she would make music that I enjoyed more in the real world. Sure. I have no reason that I wouldn't give Trouble Gum a listen because to me in my mind hip hop is different rules it is that is a production first type of music so i don't get mad when a hip hop song is too slick uh in the same way i do uh, a guitar driven song for example okay so i i think i would be into trouble gum dave cole i i think i would listen to him as much as i listen to adam levine which is <laughs> just about zero unfortunately nothing nothing against the guy just uh, a little too polished as as we've established for my taste that's fair and I get it. But you're gung ho. Ah, this is, these are all these are all in rotation for you. No. So I, I'm more so attached to them in the way that they relate to the movie. I was not very attached to them listening to the songs before I watched and found out about the Greg Alexander. It's like compounding things that I enjoyed to make me enjoy the songs more. If the Dave Cole songs just existed in our reality, it would be very similar to a Maroon 5 song coming out and me letting it pass by and only hearing it on the radio. Sure. Okay. So context adds value, is what you're saying. Yes, I think so. I I am a visual person. So like when an audio, like if I see a music video that I really like, it will make me enjoy the song more when I'm listening to it in an audio only way. That's true. That was a big sticking point going into this. We almost had to go to a TV station before we got this deal with K-Flix. Exactly. Because uh, you wanted a visual component. I did want a visual component, but you know, maybe down the line. Indeed. So Sean, what do you think? Have we begun again? I think I've begun for the first time, honestly. Well, with every beginning comes an ending and it's just about that time we bid farewell to all you listeners and thank you again for joining us on kflix 198.4 and uh we're so glad you tuned in and we'd love to hear your thoughts on films and artists to cover in the future what do you want us to talk about we're going to talk about it all so let us know what you want us to talk about uh for episode 21 because we got the first 20 nailed down and you can't pick That's a good point, but it's a free for all after that because we each had ten ideas and and we're out. Yeah, there's we're no gonna more have to ideas stop making it if we don't hear from you guys. Kflix Fiction Radio. Watch a movie and so jam it out. Kflix One Ninety Point Four Fiction Radio.